founder of Probable Futures, Spencer, is working to highlight the many assumptions inherent in our lives and institutions that will be violated by a warming world and to accelerate efforts to understand, imagine, and prepare for a very different future. He is a senior fellow at the Woods Hole Research Center. Please welcome Spencer Glendon, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. That song is The Heat Goes On by the Talking Heads. I want you to start by imagining if this hall were about 15 or 20 degrees warmer, a bit humid all day. And then someone offered you an icy drink. You would pay money for that. If I'd been here in the late 1800s, I could have pitched ice stocks to you. Most people thought, however, they were great shorts, the ice stocks. But the skeptics turned out to be wrong because the value of being cool on a really hot day is enormous. In fact, some of the biggest fortunes in New England were built by cutting the tops off of ponds all around Boston. And then the blocks that formed were shipped all the way around the world to India. They were packed in hay, they were stored in ice houses, and then the merchants waited until the point of maximum pressure to sell them to miserable people in hot places. But ice's wonders don't stop at cold. It's really nice how it's cold, but it also does something very interesting to a drink, which is it keeps it the same temperature. Once you put ice in, it stays that temperature. It's actually done the same for our atmosphere. You see, ice is both cold and reflective. When light hits ice or snow, almost all of it vibrates back, reflects back into space. But when it hits the dark sea, almost all of it is reflected. You can see it by looking at pictures of Earth from space. So just as satellites like this have taught us about how the climate works, ice has actually taught us about the history of our planet. You see, Antarctica gets about an inch of snow a year. And over 800,000 years, that snow has accumulated. And scientists figured out how to drill holes so they could get each layer of that ice or snow. And it captured each year's air in it, which told them how hot it was, or in this case, cold. So this is the temperature of every winter going back 800,000 years in Antarctica, start ending in 1900. It's the longest data series you're going to see today, I'm pretty sure. Now, what these models also did was show that while scientists knew carbon dioxide trapped heat, it turned out to be essentially the only variable that mattered. This is the carbon dioxide in those same bubbles matched up with Antarctic temperature. Every time it was warmer, there was more CO2, and every time it was colder, there was less. Now, scientists knew this was true in a lab, but this data showed them that it was true. On this map, it's, I mean, it's longer than you need because humans didn't even emerge until about 200,000 years ago. And they wandered around the world. And then about 10,000 years ago, they settled. And Greenland's ice tells us why. So I'm 50. When I was a kid, we learned that human beings settled around 9,500 9, BC in a bunch of different places at the same time, but nobody knew why. Later, climate science showed us. You can see the temperature above Greenland was volatile, swung 5, 10 degrees either way until 12,000 years ago or 10,000 BC. And then it stabilized. In a volatile world, it's rational to be a nomad. You wander around because the nice places don't stay nice. But in 10,000 BC, the world stabilized and became perfect for us. It was a super low vol equilibrium. The nice places stayed nice, so humans settled there. And settling is what led to this very event. Because people who settle have capital. They save, they invest, they specialize, they plan. Nomads don't. So what I've done here is overlaid the CO2 graph and the temperature graph. In finance, people like lines that go together. Here's a line, two lines that go together for a really long time. I've also put the X for where we are on carbon dioxide now. It's 50% above what was just right for us. And so I hope this is clear. Civilization is built on a stable climate, and we are now moving rapidly into instability. 
And I'm quite sure that people's financial models don't reflect that. Now, I know this ice story probably seems abstract. You've had concrete stories today. But ice is melting as we warm the world, and it will likely surprise you how much this is going to matter in financial markets. It's already relevant, but it's going to matter a lot more very soon. So let's take this chart here. This is the map. This is just a graph. This is data of how much ice there is in the Arctic. So the green line on the outside is the end of summer. Sorry, the end of winter in April. And the black line is the end of summer in September. Each spoke is a year. So we go from 1979 around to 2019. And you can see that at the end of summer, there's now 70% less ice than there was in the 80s. And we're heading towards zero quite quickly. There's a little sign in a garden by my house in Boston. It says, plants grow by the inch but die by the foot. The Antarctic ice grew by about an inch in a year, a year, but we are lopping off a lot more than feet. For perspective, let's use a, a New York landmark, the Statue of Liberty. The average American is responsible, their carbon emissions responsible for melting annually about three and a half Statues of Liberties, or SOLs you might call them, per year. People like me who travel, I'm going to guess people like you, it's more like seven or eight every single year. And you think, how could it be that much ice? How much ice is there? Well, give you a little sense of perspective. This is just Antarctica. Remember, that was a Statue of Liberty. Here's a symbol of civilization. It's 1,000 feet. Here's the Burj Khalifa. It's a symbol of the value of pumping oil and gas. Here's the Rockies. It's 14,000 feet high at its highest point. I want to give you a sense of scale. And part of why I do this work is it's full of wonder. It's amazing. Antarctica is a continent of ice as thick as the Rockies. It's bigger than the US and Mexico put together, and it's thicker than the Rockies. It's so big that it has its own gravitational pull towards it, so the ocean is higher around Antarctica than anywhere else in the world. It's cool. But what does losing this ice mean? You didn't come here for science class. You came here for action. This really big deal matters for lots of places. I'm going to give you one example, which is Florida. Now, I want you to look at that picture in the background. It's just so nice. It's like the right ratio of sand and beach and water, right? The sand and the water are just in the right proportion. So many people are there. It's hot, but it's not too hot. Look how many people have moved to Florida. This is Florida's population. You know what's coming to greet those people as they move to Florida? The ocean. These are sea level, and they are, they are accelerating. Why? Because that ice melting is accelerating. And as it does, it's putting more ice into the sea, and Antarctica is losing its gravitational pull. What does it mean when it arrives? This is what Florida is built on. It's porous limestone. You can see it's just shells and bits of beach glass and other stuff smushed together. In 2013, I was in a small meeting with a former governor of Florida who was considering a presidential bid. I asked him how he thought about climate change. He told me how a higher ocean is heavier and why that causes problems for Florida. First, he said, all the toilets in Florida flush into the ocean. And as the ocean gets heavier, it starts pushing back. This is a big problem. Not only that, but that porous limestone allows water to infiltrate it. And as the ocean gets heavier and heavier, it pushes through and reaches into the aquifers so the tap water gets salty. And the soil gets salty. All these things are already well underway in Florida. But there's another problem, which is tidal flooding. Now, for those of you who've been in Miami at high tide, especially certain seasons of the year, just on a sunny day, you know that this flooding, it doesn't come over the beach. It comes up through the sewers. It's not in their promotional materials. <laughs> and this is without talking about wetter, more powerful storms. You see, the ocean is hotter, which means it has more energy. And the atmosphere is warmer, which means it holds more water. So storms can be more powerful and dump way, way more rain. Unfortunately, the ocean isn't Florida's only problem. Because the other thing that's going to happen, there's been a lot of talk, on the periphery anyway, about flooding. We need to focus just on heat. Heat itself is a severe problem, and it is moving rapidly. And this is going to be a problem for Florida. So the National Weather Service defines the danger zone 
as being above 96 degrees Fahrenheit and 40% relative humidity. You, you know that temperature in Manhattan. It's those days when you just can't bear to go outside. Now, most of Florida will pass these levels three months a year. This is a map of Florida, from, or the United States, and it shows how often days will be in the danger zone in the 2040s. And so for Florida, it's sort of 90 days a year on average. If you want to understand what that means, it means Disney World will be closed. Because it won't be safe to take children there. And it certainly won't be safe to be in a fuzzy suit. Now, Florida's economy, you may still think it was 2040, it's a ways off. The problem is Florida's economy is built on 30-year debt. There are lots of people putting long-term money to work in Florida. And that long-term debt is underwritten by annual insurance. The condition of having a mortgage is that you have insurance, but while the mortgage people offered you 30, the insurance people only offer you one. And they've made no commitment to do, their, do that further out. And we're doing work that shows there will be no insurance in lots of Florida quite soon. You shouldn't be lending now. And as Florida gets wetter and saltier and hotter and more volatile, insurance markets will dry up. It's already foolish to lend money for 30 years for municipal bonds and for mortgages. So when will Florida's economy fall apart? People talk about when it will be underwater. No, no, it's not when it will be underwater. It's when people stop lending 30-year money. And when that happens, everything will go with it. Because I spend my time now thinking about the weaknesses in society, the vulnerabilities that come from the assumptions we've made about climate. Everybody in Florida assumes that population graph will keep rising. Every city assumes 30% population growth. And they all assume it will stay super nice. And they don't charge income tax. It's a climate liability. They are utterly dependent on real estate. When real estate even slows in Florida, the economy will go to hell. When will this happen? It could happen tomorrow. As soon as people stop lending for 30 years, as soon as Moody starts asking about municipal bond financing, it could be in big trouble quickly. Now, you may think, all right, I came here, a guy talked about climate change in Florida, I've sort of heard that. Florida is bad, how bad could it be? But I've got a few minutes left and I want to show you that this was just an example I chose because I thought it might be resonant. This is Australia in the late 20th century. This is how often it was in drought. So each color represents the number of three month periods that were in drought over the decades then. So there were droughts pretty often. Remember Australia is actually a small country. It's two slivers of civilization between a desert and an ocean. This is what the very proximate future looks like. It's already happening quite quickly. People, the desert is moving in. It's getting squeezed. And the ocean is rising towards them. What about Europe? Europe used to have droughts as the end of the 20th century. Used to have, have droughts once in a while. You can see the Sahara in Africa was brutal. This is 2040. The Sahara will jump over the Mediterranean. Spain, Italy, Greece, Portugal, and Spain, and uh, what do we got? The pigs. It's the pigs. It's the roast pigs, if you will. They will be in deep trouble because they will be in permanent drought. Dark red means permanent drought. Relentless. And this is just 2040. This is just a snapshot. It keeps moving after this. What about closer to home? We had drought once in a while. This is 2040s. I haven't shown Northern California. But here you can see what happens in Mexico. This has already been a problem. Already now there are caravans of people in the places that have dried out the most, that have hurt forests and, and harvests in Central America. And here's India. Most of your models assume India will grow a lot. What you can see is in the late 20th century, India had Florida's future. Often very hot, but not brutal most of the time. India will be in the danger zone, most of India, most of the time. Which is to say, India, whose GDP comes from people doing agriculture, construction, infrastructure principally, will be a place where you can't be outdoors during the day. That's not to talk about the rest of South Asia, and I didn't even show the Middle East. So this is an action-oriented conference. You can make action. You can short real estate in a bunch of places or just sell it. Mortgage-backed securities are going to be a mess. Florida banks, municipal bonds, you could just do global growth. 
because so much of it is dependent on hot places that are supposed to get rich. But you could also do something different. And I, what I want you to remember is that I was talking to that governor and I asked him, what did you do when you were in charge? He said, oh, we, we should have changed all the zoning and all the building codes in Florida. And I said, well, why didn't you? And he said, well, it was nobody's number one priority. And I know it's unlikely to be your number one priority now, but what I'm telling you is it will be. Those maps mean it will be your number one priority. And so when that happens, if you wait, if you wait for it to be forced on us to be the number one priority, we will not live in a place where you can have free markets. It will be a disaster. We will be working in an environment where we will be putting out emergencies. I have a PhD in economic history. We've lived in a very special time when people could do whatever they wanted. This is a conference about helping children get out of childhood and have the adulthoods they want. And so the other action you could do now, and it will be good for your business, is take advantage of all the good people you know who come to you and want to talk about things. You can talk to your clients, your counterparties, your lenders, the banks, the politicians who ask you for money relentlessly, and the companies you invest in. You can push those ratings agencies and say, we should have better zoning and building codes, electrify everything, promote clean energy. It's good for business. If you want your kids to be able to go to conferences like this, we should do this now. It's not, doesn't take that much to start having these conversations. I'm very grateful for your time. I hope this has been helpful to you. Thank you for the invitation and be well.